some with uh, me assisting a, a current board member uh, with some of her questions. It, it got me interested again. There was a time when I stepped away from public service and I felt that uh, that calling again to come back and try to serve. My interest is certainly to serve uh, the parents to make sure that our children have access to good quality education. I also have concerns about fiscal responsibility. Um, the budget is quite large, a lot of money is being spent. Uh, certainly I, I, I expect it to be found to be all good, but, but certainly I, I come from a fiscally conservative background and but I'd like to see more done with what the budget we have. Also, citizens of Christian County have a high tax burden. I think we all understand that, that it takes money to educate. And I'm not ignorant of that, but also uh, I think the public pays its fair share. And I'd like to see and make sure that every dollar goes as far as possible for private. 
Um, I have also had some experience with the administration that left me with questions. Um, certainly it would appear at times the administration has, at least with the city of Ozark, come across aggressive or heavy handed, not unfriendly, but certainly doing what they could to, to get the most out of their efforts. I, I realize I'm out of time. Yeah. Thank you so much. Go next. Well, good evening. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you to the PTA, uh, the current administration, the, the uh, current school board for coming out, and of course all the parents out there who are doing the hard job at home. Uh, my name is James uh, Griffin. I am a husband, father, and follower of Jesus Christ. I have been married for 23 years, 24 this year, and I have three amazing boys who all went through Ozark schools. One is currently in the Marine Corps, one is in the Army, and Intel, finishing up Intel school right now and he'll be in Army, Army uh, Missouri National Guard. I've got one in Ozark Middle School, and I am a 21-year uh, retired Navy commander. I, did, I was a helicopter pilot, did tours in Afghanistan, the Pentagon, uh, Middle East, as well as uh, uh, us, the Commander of the Navy Reserve Center here in Springfield, which is what brought us, brought uh, my family to this amazing area. I'm a business owner and volunteer wherever I go, uh, including our church. I'm the president of the, of the Board of Directors for Like Away Ministry, which is a local nonprofit here in Ozark. I am also a uh, volunteer soccer coach at the OC, which is actually where I was at yesterday, last night after getting home from, from a cruise. So uh, as you can see, my life has been based on service to God, families, not just my own, the community, uh, and our great amazing country. So I want to continue that legacy of service by by uh, utilizing the experience, knowledge, and expertise that, that I gained in all those places and bring it to our local area as a school board member in Ozark. Uh, I recognize this is an amazing place and I want to keep it that way. Public schools are one of the most influential institutions in our, in our world, in our country, and certainly the world, and upon our children. Um, so we need to recognize that and uh, the decisions that we make today influence those children, our children here but also the next generations as we proceed forward, uh, the generations here in Ozark, Springfield, Missouri, and the country. Thanks. Mine's gonna be a little bit shorter than that. Uh, my name is Dustin Kirkman. I am a local resident here in Ozark. I'm married to a, a wonderful woman named Rachel. We have three kids uh, that range from 15 to uh, eight years old. Uh, they've all attended Ozark schools. Um, I am actually a former educator myself. Uh, my wife is an educator and a coach. Um, and, uh, you know, I've always been passionate. My mother's actually a retired teacher. So the school system has always been something that is near and dear to our heart. Uh, we are actively and have actively um, supported the PTA through Ozark East. It's one of my two youngest in the school. Um, we moved here in about 2014 when I took over my business here in town. Um, and uh, one of the reasons we, we moved here, um, a large part, was to this, for the school system. It's, um, it's actually where I took my first coaching job was in Ozark. Um, I had the opportunity to, uh, to take a spot out of college and, and work that, and it led to future endeavors with it. Um, and, it, and you know, with raising kids and so forth, it was one of those where we went, there's no better place to be. And, uh, and it's really what drove us to, to end up back here. Um, the, you know, the, the probably the process or the reasoning for me to, to run for this specific spot is uh, I, I, I'm all things Ozark, you know, and I enjoy seeing all things Ozark succeed and, and no motives, no anything else other than that's kind of my, that's my passion. So actively involved, rotary member, uh, involved the chamber, uh, involved to help you know pack school lunches and things like that with the school with, when it comes to the summer feeding program and, and you name know, it, just the way I was doing it. But that's because we've got a we've got a great place to live, we've got a great school system, and, and I enjoy being part of it. Okay. Hello, hello everyone, and I thank you for all for coming out. But I really want to thank the PTA for hosting this event. Um, I've lived in Ozark 43 years, and actually we moved to Ozark because of our kids. They were preschoolers then, but we moved because of the school system. My son Derek and my daughter Tania both are graduates of Ozark High School. I currently have two grandkids in the school system. Coraline is at middle school, and Henry is at North. 
I have always been passionate about Ozark schools and our community. I retired from Kraft Foods in, with 38 years of service, am I not coming out? <laughs> sorry about that, can you hear me now then? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Anyway, I retired from Kraft after 38 years. I had a degree in business management. I have actually served on this board for 27 years. And my reason is the same today as it was 28 years ago when I filed. I love kids and I believe in education. I am committed to represent this community as a collective voice with your interest while making decisions that will always put the student first. I want to continue to be a voice and an advocate for all students, our teachers in public education, whether here in, in Ozark or across the state. Our school district, if you didn't know, when I became on the board, I looked back and our student count was over 3,000 students. <laughs> Currently, we are almost 6,000 students, so we have doubled in 27 years. After the graduation rate at that time was 85%, last May, we graduated 97.8% of our students. <clears throat> it is really great to see this happened because I can remember when the dropout rate, we were so concerned about it. But during that period, we put in our alternative school and we give an option for our students that drop out or don't feel like they can succeed in the high school setting. And we've had numerous graduates from there. I was actually a part of putting that together along with Dan Evans when we started it. Quality in the, all right, thank you. <laughs> I am, PTA, I am a PTA member of North and Middle School. Perfect. Okay. All right. Um, now we're going to bring up our school's um, PTA officers. I believe it's all presidents that are coming up. There may be some um, other officers that are coming, but um, I'll call each school up to ask a question that they have provided. And since we're short of mic, should I just like slide mine over? Yeah. Because we can do that. Okay, so the first school to call up will be North Elementary. Hello, my name is Rihanna Leach, and I have the privilege of being the PTA president at Ozark North, and thank you for taking your time to be here tonight. As an active part of PTA, we clearly see that time spent within our schools is vital to keeping a pulse on a school or district's needs. How often in the last year have you spent your time volunteering in a school? Were those hours in an Ozark school? And the follow-up would be, if the hours are minimal or zero, how do you uh, feel you're understanding the true school or district needs? Okay, and this time we'll start with you, and we'll just keep skipping as we go. Thanks, Brianna. Uh, so as far as Ozark schools uh, at Ozark North, Whenever Mrs. Edder, uh, my youngest son, son's teacher, would ask for uh, parents to come and help at events or for the, uh, for the field days, my wife and I, Michelle, would, would routinely go and support those every time. Uh, besides that, like I said before, I'm, a, I'm an OC, a volunteer at Ozark soccer coach, which, which deals with Ozark students uh, three to four hours a week, three months out of the year in spring, and three months in the, uh, in the fall. And like I said, it's actually, we had practice last night and a game this week, so if anyone wants to come out. <laughs> uh, besides that, I'm also a, a, a volunteer at our church. We have a volunteer life group leader, which has a number of, of Ozark students in our group. So that's another three to five hours a week. Uh, besides that, I'm also the president of Life Away Ministry, uh, of the board for Life Away Ministries, which also supports local uh, events here. We had a huge festival here last summer, which supports Ozark. Uh, families and youth and students. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I was trying to think back in, in hours, and honestly, um, I have no idea how many. I haven't, you know, counted. It wasn't really the, the point um, for me to count. Uh, but the answer would be numerous, and so um, it kind of in multiple facets. My um, my involvement with the school uh, largely has to do with athletics in, in some ways. Uh, I was a former coach, and that's one way that I can help support the school system. So I spent a lot of time in the gym, a lot of time on the baseball fields, and a lot of time on the football fields. Uh, but beyond that, um, 
you know, I do spend time um, in supporting areas like um, the Turtle Learning Project where we help summer feeding, right? We pack a lot of lunches, we pack a lot of food, and all that work's done behind the scenes. Um, we have another program through Rotary that's called the Don't Meth With Us program. We might be here for a little while, or a few hours, and each and we do it here at all the elementaries in uh, for the fifth grade. Um, and then we do it as well in Sparta and in Chadwick. Um, and it's a great program. There's a lot of time that goes into that beyond just the hours. <laughs> As far as volunteering, um, I'm kind of OCD. I keep track of things, what hours I've done and, and what, how many miles I drive or whatever. It's just something I want to know. But I looked at that today and I've probably over 100 hours spent in the schools. I love to help with class parties and skills day. That's one of my favorite things, helping skills day. Um, but I also, if you know me, I enjoy reading to the kiddos. So I've been a mystery reader for years. I usually take a whole day or two before Christmas and I asked to come to the Tiger Hall on all four elementary schools. I spend a whole day going from one building to the other, reading to kindergarten or first graders. Um, I've been invited by second and third grade classes also, but I'm open for anything if you want to ask me. <laughs> As an elected school board volunteer, if you take that into consideration, I do walkthroughs with our superintendent, Lori. I attend plays, concerts. I've attended several of the FFA fundraisers, and I love seeing those kids in action. Uh, the showcases here at the OIC with the students here at the at this building, art exhibits and everything, but I try to get out and see as much as I can, basketball games, softball. Thank you. Uh, the short answer would be not very much. Uh, since my son graduated high school, I have not been uh, on campus as much. When he was in school, certainly I, I or my wife at the time uh, would volunteer and we would participate. I do have a previous history in doing, a, I'm an attorney by trade, so I, when I was a young attorney, I would do uh, IDA work. I would represent students, often for well known, those are Springfield and other Southwest Missouri towns, to, to make sure that they would receive the appropriate education under the federal law. Uh, certainly, uh, I do believe it is important to volunteer in all aspects of life and be familiar with the school system. Uh, what I would bring to the board would be more of an experience from the legal side for the enforcement of IDA, and also the understanding that uh, I would have to spend more time, obviously, on the campuses and the schools, as I would. Okay, our, our next school that we'll bring up in Ozark Middle School. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello, my name is Samantha Burns. I am, like Cindy said, here from Ozark Middle School. Thank you all for being here. Um, I, my question is, today, what are some of the biggest challenges facing schools and how will you address them? Well, we'll start with you. So, thank you, Samantha, for the question. That is a big, broad question, so I'm going to try to kind of end quick on this so in a minute. But, you know, obviously, the, the tax crunch is, is, everybody feels it in their pocketbook, right? And so the challenge for the school is, it's a big cost. Um, we have to be fiscally responsible with our money. Um, the other thing that I'm going to say is, you know, we've got other things that we've got to make sure that our kids and our teachers are safe, right? We remain competitive when it comes to teacher power, uh, salaries and pay. Um, along while making sure things that like bridging technology um, with knowledge, which I think are two different things. Um, so when you kind of look at the facets of some of the challenges, there's a bunch, right? And we kind of, kind of have to attack it in pieces uh, as we go along. Okay. All right, we'll go to Kate. Um, two things that I felt that are challenging, there's several things, but two that I want to mention is teacher retention, um, competitive salaries, as, as uh, Dustin said, but we were able to raise our base salary to 41,000 last year, which is, I feel like it's awesome. We also were able to give a raise across across all staff. I think we need to look at that every year if it's financially possible, especially if it's a cost of living raise because we know costs keep going up. The other thing is the climate culture for our teachers. We need to create a culture in our buildings where teacher, our teachers are respected, that they feel safe, and they feel appreciated. We need to praise their accomplishments, respect their input, input their time, and their successes. We need to ask them to the table to make decisions. 
The other thing is safety. I think we do some things great here in Ozark as long as for safety because we have SROs across the district. We build our last storm shelters for every building. We have safe entrances, training with our students and our staff regarding fires, tornadoes, and even active shooter drills, which, you know. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Obviously, I believe finances and fiscal responsibility should be a number one issue. I believe that we need to be able as a board to have a better understanding as to the expenditures that are incurred by the district and the monies that are coming in. I would do uh, or suggest that there would be a review of the existing expenditures of the school district. Try to determine if there's any clear alternatives that are cheaper. Sometimes cheaper alternatives can be better. Sometimes it can be the same. Sometimes it can be a little bit worse. There has to be an evaluation of how this is done and whether it can be continued to be done that way. Obviously, there has to also be a safe environment for our schools. We hear too often stories in other districts about teachers or students being harmed. Certainly, uh, I want to make sure that our children, our teachers, and our parents are safe on campus and take steps to review the current system that we have in place, which seems to be quite safe, uh, and make sure that we continue that type of environment. When you look at Ozark, we, when we first came to Ozark, uh, back when I was the commander of the Navy Reserve Center, uh, I came here because, well, one of the top reasons was the schools were great. Um, when I moved back here after retiring from the Navy, I didn't look at any other districts. I looked only at Ozark, and that was the only place we wanted to buy a house and move to because, well, my sons have, have friends here and they want to be in the Ozark schools. So starting with that baseline, uh, we look at, I look at the top three issues that I, that I consider, and my, my main things are family values. I want to make sure that I think Ozark, this area, is great because the family values are already established here, and I want to seek to maintain those values across the board. Uh, look at Ozark first. When I say Ozark first, it's policies that seek to promote this area first, as opposed to federal or, or uh, state or other external organizations that want to impose their values on us. So uh, we want to we want to just look at those first, and then finally, finally is uh, financial responsibility and accountability, uh, aligning the finances, the budget to all uh, three of those areas as well, and maintaining that your tax dollars are well accounted for. Thank you so much. Um, our next school that we will ask to come forward is South Elementary. Hi guys, um, my name is Jess Levin, I'm the president at Ozark South Elementary. Um, our question tonight is, can you please describe what you feel the role of the school board is in the local community and who do you feel they are ultimately accountable to? Let's start with me. Yes. I believe it's vital for a board member to be involved in their community. You need to build relationships with the community, whether it's city officials, business owners, your emergency responders, senior citizens, and especially our parents. I have tried to do that over the last several years, getting to know, I can call them by first name, most of them. As we, as a board elected by the people to represent as a leader and decision maker for our schools and for our students, we need to earn that trust to do what's best for our students. We need to build the confident, confidence of the people by the decisions we make for Ozark schools to remain one of the best districts in the area. And I vow to do that. The goal and purpose of the school board is to provide oversight for the school administration, which then leads to services to our children. As far as the community, our interaction with the board would be to convey to the community that we are performing our jobs. One of the main reasons we do that is have open and transparent meetings, meetings that discuss the substance, the meat, the potatoes, of how it takes to run a board and how it takes to run a district. The more information the public has, the better they feel about the performance of the job that is being done. Questions and suspicions are raised when things are not answered in the public life, and that's why I would say one of the most important things the board could do is make sure that their information about the finances and about the ongoings and what's going on in the district is made public through meetings, through town halls, and through discussions with parents and city representatives and county representatives. Okay. Thank you. The school board is the elected body uh, that is directly accountable to you, the public, 
that's the go between between the public and the school administration. So as far as what what the school board is supposed to do, uh, obviously the oversight of, of the superintendent and the public of uh, the overall government governance and um, running of the school of the public schools. What does that actually mean? Uh, I take a look at three three separate areas. What I see is we we establish policy, we create and craft policy that goes back to those core fundamentals that I mentioned that is designed to support this area. Uh, we then craft strategic plans and vision for the next for the current year as well as, well as the out years uh, <laughs> that go back to that policy. And then we craft a budget, maintain a budget that is uh, fiscally responsible in order to execute that, that strategic plan and those policies. So it kind of go, goes along, along all, all three of those lines and back to those core fundamentals of, of family values, financial responsibility as of course. Thank you. So uh, I fundamentally believe that the school boards elected represent the students, uh, parents, staff, and the community. Um, and, and you do so by making informed decisions. You know, they, um, you, you make informed decisions about policy. You, um, you help with the budget, obviously that's a hot topic, right? Um, and, and you help in hiring and evaluating the superintendent. As a board, you only have one employee, and it's your superintendent, right? You help evaluate and hire that person and make sure that they're doing their job and running the school. Um, ultimately, I feel like you're, you're accountable um, to the public, but that's a pretty general term. I think you're accountable to the parents. You're accountable to, I'm going to say, just general taxpayers, but you're also accountable to the students, right? Um, we trust the people that are on this board to take care of our kiddos. And, and that's kind of the kind of a primary focus of, of your board. Thank you. All right, the next question will come from Tiger Paul. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna go ahead and read that question. They did submit a question, but we weren't sure if they were here tonight. So um, the question they uh, brought forward is, if necessary, where would you cut the school budget? And what would you consider off limits? And why? We'll start with you. Um, it's cutting the budget. You have to do a process where you identify uh, where the expenditures go, uh, out of what departments, whether it's payroll or operations, uh, meaning that you would identify the department, identify the payroll, operations, and money to spent. As far as um, how you go about through determining where it will occur, after you would determine uh, what's going out from what areas, you would look to see what we're in compliance with as far as state and federal regulations for curriculum and other responsibilities. I mean, certainly we do answer to some degree to other governmental entities. And if we are in compliance with those and we have room to spare, then yeah, there would be areas that you could cut. As far as what's off limits, certainly um, I don't think you can enter into a budget process and not say, say something's off limits. I guess what I'm trying to say is, that determination will be made through the examination of existing expenditures, identifying where we have extra money to move around or cut. I'm not one to cut anything. What I'm really looking for is identifying shortfalls and compensating those shortfalls as we would with our household budget, with areas where we have extra money. Thank you. First off, it's important to understand the current budget for this this fiscal year is approximately 101 million dollars. Now that said, uh, when you look at budget cuts, uh, you need to know is it a cut in this fiscal year or the following the out years? Uh, before even doing any of that, what is the most important thing in the district? What how do you run? What is the most important asset for your organization to run? And that's teachers. Without teachers, we can't teach. We it's what we do in our, in our school district. So. Uh, if we have to make cuts in the current fiscal year, well, we're going to fence teacher pay, obviously, because we can't produce students without teachers. Um, then what do we look at as far as making cuts? Uh, I would look at pausing or delaying capital projects, other maintenance projects, although those are certainly important in the strategic plan and vision, uh, we have to look at people first. So uh, more important than that is looking at a budget that promotes fiscal responsibility. Uh, that promotes potential surpluses where we can absorb those cuts in the future. 
whether it's a, a cut from the federal, state, or even the local level. So, can this happen? Yes. Should they? You know, ideally, you plan for that, and it shouldn't happen. But that's a great question. Um, and you know, we'll, as it's kind of mentioned, it's a massive budget, right? So, to kind of sit here without being privy to the entire budget right now. Uh, I'd be kind of throwing darts in the dark a little bit, but um, what I would tell you is that, you know, one of the few things that would be off limits to me would be the, the kids' safety, both kids' safety and the teachers' safety. Um, and then I think another one we really have to look at is Missouri ranks 50th right now in new teacher pay. Okay, we're 50. There's nowhere to really go. We're at the bottom. <laughs> we rank 47 in overall pay. I think it's probably safe to say we don't need to make any cuts in that area. If you start cutting teachers, you're not going to attract quality teachers, and you're not going to retain quality teachers. And who ultimately pays the price for that? Again, it's your kids. So without knowing the ins and outs of the current budget, I'd have to say if I was going to tax something, I would start with inefficiencies. When you have a um, any, any operations that's this size or this magnitude, you always are going to have some inefficiencies. I start there, and then I kind of work my way down. Uh, the question asked, where would I cut the school budget? As a board member, as one board member, I don't would not want to decide that. I think what we should do is develop a committee of board members, teachers, administrators, other staff, maybe community, some community members, and sit down and talk about it. Not go through the whole budget line by line, but look at have some suggestions, brainstorm what some things we could cut, and look at those ideals and those cuts. Would it be a, would that budget line be a value in the education of our students and their academic success? If that's true, then absolutely do not cut. But I think that's something that you should come together as a committee to look through. I don't feel like that's a decision of me or even the board. I think it would come to the board eventually after this committee went through that. I hope that we don't have to do that. The other thing, the off limits would be absolutely do not cut teacher salaries. That was one of our goals is to retain our teachers and we increase that salary. We might have to freeze salaries if it was a year where the budget and the funds weren't coming in, but I do not believe that's something we should ever cut. Thank you. Okay. Now I'm going to bring up my favorite elementary school. <laughs> Those are keys. <laughs> you can tell where my kids went, right? <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Brittany Matthews. I am the PTA Vice President at East. And our question is, how are our schools planning to ensure that students graduate with the knowledge and skills they need to be college and career ready? So the first thing is we need to make sure we have academic excellence across the board. So it starts from early childhood education through uh, through elementary, middle school, senior high, and high school. So assuming that we're having academic excellence as a standard through all those, at the, at the high school level, we want to have programs that ensure that students have avenues where uh, they're not just focused on college, but you know, other opportunities that are outside college, because we all know that not every child, not every student is gonna to go to college. It's not the right fit. Some can go straight to business, some can go straight to a trade school. I think currently Ozark has some of those, some of those great opportunities. So we have the IV program, although I believe it's being phased out. Uh, we have the AP program. Uh, we have dual enrollment, as well as some trade school options. So, you know, when you look at all those things, what, whatever, whatever those avenues are, it need, we need to look at opportunities where students can can take advantage of the um, of their their values of whether, whether they want to continue in trade school or even the military as some of my kids have done. Okay. I'm going to echo a little bit of what James said here. I think it just started your elementary. Um, they're they're so young and they're impressionable at that age, and getting them off to the right start uh, is vital. And, and I'm going to say, I think that Ozark has had great community support for a very long time. Uh, the OIC is a big step in bridging academia and real world experience. Um, as somebody who is a business owner, I do lots of interviews. Um, and I can tell you one of the biggest challenges that I see for 
for some of the kids coming out is the lack of communication skills, right? So how do we bridge the use of technology and also how to have a conversation with someone? And it's a real hurdle. So there's things that I think we can do. It's an always evolving world and it's always evolving the education system. And I think that's where you can continue to push is go, hey, how do we get the book smarts and also some real world application? Thank you. Yes. I think we're doing a great job right now, but I do think that in that, with our preschool, Congress Hall School, all the way through 12th grade, that our curriculum is aligned for those students to succeed as they move up to the 12th grade. As some of them have said about our different programs, especially the OIC here with all the different pathways, the six pathways, there's opportunities to gain your credits or whatever to move on into college, but also you may be able to get a certificate and move right into the workplace. Just like our career center when we do our automotive classes there. Some of those students graduate with that, I can't remember the initial SEC, is that correct? Where it's automotive maintenance. But I think that's key. And I know when we did our graduation last year, 76% of them had diploma and, and the and means what else do they have besides just that high school diploma. I think we need to continue doing assessments throughout the school year. Don't wait for the math test, because they're gone by then. We need to do the assessments so that student sets a goal and they know where they're at so they can continue to improve. Parent engagement, I believe, is key in this. They need to be, the parents need to be involved with the school's staff to work with that student to set a pathway. Thank you. Okay. When it comes to career life choices, it's, the way I look at it is, uh, it's like pastries or desserts, you know, um, some people are pies, some people are cakes, some people are cupcakes, but a lot of them still have the same ingredients, and a lot of them still have to take time in the oven. A lot of them uh, still, you know, need to have that final touch. I guess what I'm trying to say is we have to have a school district that is diverse, that can provide the basic education, provide an environment where a student can be confident, can provide the opportunities to work outside and think outside the box, to, to come out of this school with the necessary skills, to be the dessert they want to be. So I guess what I'm wanting to do is make sure that as a board member that we give these kids everything they need so they can get to the point in life where they want to be. And that would be a good curriculum. That would be the basic life skills that people need. That would be the social interaction that we seem to lose sometimes, that faith in family, that faith in community, the hard work, you know, the determination. And, and that is a lot to ask for parents and teachers. That, that's something I think we need to do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and then our last school with a question tonight is West Elementary. Good evening. My name is Danielle Mann, and I am the Vice President all alongside Shannon Merriman at the Park West. And a lot of you have touched on this question already, um, but as a former educator, it's definitely near and dear to my heart. Um, we have all heard about nationwide teacher shortages and teacher attention. How will you help address this within our district? So, um, it's a great question, thank you, Danielle, because I think it's one that is, is on everybody's mind. Um, and, I, and I'm going to start with, I think you've got to identify the reasons why we're losing teachers, right? Why are we losing tenured teachers, uh, your quality teachers, and why are there less people going into teaching right now? And, and it's probably a multitude of answers that go into this, um, but I think it boils down to a couple, um, uh, I would say primary answers, right? One of those being they need teacher support. And support means a lot of different things. We've got, to, uh, we mentioned kind of the salary, We've got to get better at what we're doing, right? And everything's, everything, the budget's high, uh, but we've got to be better at, at teacher salary. The other thing is, is discipline, right? And I think that's a major one that pushes teachers out right now. Policy to support teachers to handle the discipline issues that are going on needs to happen. Thank you. Of course, I stated this before about the competitive salaries, which I think we're doing well at in the culture and climate. Show that respect, show that appreciation, show the praise. Um, one thing that we are doing now is if a teacher does training or goes back to take a, pick up a class or whatever, if they apply for it, they can be reimbursed for that. 
Another thing we do, and I don't know if all of you know about it in our master's program, back in probably been 10 or 12 years ago, I think I was the one that asked it at a board meeting. We were looking at our teacher steps and I said, how many of our teachers have masters? I think it was about 27, 28% had their masters. And a lot of the reason was they didn't have the time or the money. So we put into place a master's program where our higher up administrators teach those classes. It's run through Evangel College. It may take, there's 10 to 12 students in a cohort, it may take a couple of years to accomplish that. But in that time frame, we are now at 75% of our teachers have their master's degree. So I think if we can do things like that to help the teacher better themselves, but also to make them feel rewarded, that they are respected and that they are appreciated because they are the prime reason for education that our students are successful, is those teachers. Since I never turn my mic off. Um, <laughs> information is power. Uh, so if you want to bring in and want to hire the people we need to know what they're looking for, what they want, we provide that to them. Obviously, uh, people need money and they want salaries, and that's the easy answer. But we still need to have a better understanding of what the new graduate or the experienced teacher who's looking to relocate is looking for, and, and then we try to provide that. And certainly the same thing is for retention. And when it comes to losing good teachers, we need to know why we lose good teachers. My experience in the legal field, uh, when someone leaves a job, they don't necessarily tell their boss the truth why they're leaving their job. They tell the boss what they think the boss wants to hear, or they tell the boss uh, only enough information to give the answer. But, so what I would suggest on retention, if we're losing good teachers, we want to use a third-party outside source to do an exit interview or do some type of follow-up, even if it's after they've left for a few months, to try to get the truth as to why they left. You know, we try to correct those problems. I'm not accusing anybody of doing anything wrong. I'm just saying if you want the truth, typically you have to go about it a different way than what is traditional. Thinking outside the box, trying to get the information necessary to strike the problem. It's important to understand that teachers are our most valuable assets in the school system. So, especially as our employees, uh, we, cannot, we cannot teach, we can't have our, our, our students being taught without teachers. They're the ones who are doing the hard job day in and day out. So, of course, the first part is competitive pay. That's competitive pay at the entry level, middle tier level, and senior level, you know, as you get farther along in experience. So, pay is the one thing, but what I've learned in, in, in the military as a commander is that people don't necessarily stay just because of pay. It, it can be great pay in the military, but they still can leave. So, why do they leave? It's, it's because people are not valued. People are not respected or recognized, and I think the same thing is, among, is, is also with teachers. My parents were both educators, and they were both were a career educator. So why did they stay? It's different reasons, but when you when you value uh, teachers' inputs, value their thoughts, recognize them, uh, not just give them an opportunity to to tell them to give the input, but then value what they actually said. Mm -hmm. So you want to take their inputs and actually do something with it, not just treat it as as whatever. So um, and value and input without fear of so I'd say all those pieces. Okay, thank you all so much. Those were all of the questions from our schools. And so we'll now open the floor to questions from the general public. And just a reminder when you come up uh, to ask your question, you may ask the question and then um, go ahead and be seated. So if anyone would like to come up. Hello, good evening. My name is Whitley Karanja. I am the NSTA CTA president elected by the, uh, the staff and the teachers here in the district to represent all of our staff. A lot of our questions tonight have been centered around teachers. So my question tonight is, half of our workforce are non-certified staff. So how do you as a board member um, choose to support those types of positions within our district and um, make sure that they are, their voices are also heard. Okay, start with you. Quickly, yeah, that's a great question because I think we need to respect and, and appreciate the jobs that they do. I think we need to stay competitive in their salaries also if we can. Also giving them benefits. I know a few years ago we used to add in benefits to our bus drivers, which we hadn't before in our uh, cooking staff. But I do believe that's something we need to look at as a district. It's how can we show appreciation to them? I believe that is key for a successful school because 
all of those entities see our students, whether it's a bus driver, the first one that say hello to them in the morning, or a cook at the lunchtime or breakfast time, custodian in the hallway, and they're helping to keep our schools clean. All of these, the coaches, music teachers, all of them are valuable to our students. And so I think we need to always appreciate and do what we can to make them, their job better for them. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> to keep on having workforce to plea, again, you have to address their needs, their concerns, uh, providing uh, fair pay, make sure they have benefits, being flexible schedules, being understanding with family emergencies. Certainly having uh, well-written policies that are understood and conveyed in a proper manner, make sure that their job duties are identified. So when somebody's asked to do something above and beyond what they're supposed to do, that they're compensated for those additional services as well. Not to ask uh, managers or leads to, uh, to carry too much or to do too much, so make sure that we share the burden amongst all the staff and all the employees. If we have shortages in one area and too many people in another, as I spoke before about the budget, that you adjust that accordingly. So one department's not working overtime and working too hard, and the other department's not having it too easy and getting on. Certainly, uh, I want fairness amongst all our employees. I don't want any department to be favored over one or the other. I want to make sure that they feel comfortable that they can approach management with concerns, and if management's not responsive, to approach others, go up the ladder to make sure that all employees for the school district are treated Okay. Creating a culture of excellence it starts, you know, it, it's a broad piece. So, of course, it's similar to teachers. You need competitive pay at, at whatever level those are at, whatever, whatever, whether it's a, a tech support or a bus driver. Whatever position that is, you obviously need competitive pay, but that's not what keep, keeps people, like I said, just with teachers, you need, you need a, a culture that appreciates them. Um, and it's hard to mandate that from here. It's, you can't really mandate, you're gonna be a nice person. You have to create that culture, and it takes a while. Um, this is a culture of leadership, which we saw in the, in the military. Um, it takes time. So you want, you want middle, lower level managers, which in this case can be principals, vice principals, assistants, and, and so on down the road, what, who are uh, taught, um, well, how to treat people, good, good management, good leadership, and that takes time. So you can't overnight have happy people, you all will be happy, you know? I mean, you will love your jobs. Well, it's, it, it takes time to, to train those people, to train that, those ethics, those, those pieces. The, the short answer would obviously be, you know, make sure that we've got competitive pay and competitive benefits. But um, I, I think it falls back, and I don't know if it would change just a little bit, to culture. And so we can have um, outstanding academics in the school, uh, or any workplace for that matter, and not have a very good culture. So um, it's a culture of everybody feels valued in a certain way, uh, and everybody belongs uh, to that culture and feels like they have, um, they have, they bring something to that dynamic, which is a school system that has a very wide dynamic, right? And so um, what I find, you know, when people are changing jobs, they're, they're maybe looking for a, uh, a better paying job. They might be looking for um, something where they can advance as far as their knowledge, you know, and knowledge goes. But they're also sometimes looking for a, a better leader. Right, and they're all also looking for, they want to be a part of something. And if you've got great culture, you know, it's amazing to see how many people want to be a part of it. All right, do we have any other questions from the floor? <laughs> Hi, my name is Amy Cooper. I'm a 1999 Ozark graduate, <laughs> a parent of many children who are in foster care, adoption, or biologically. Um, a couple of weeks ago, our own state representative filed a bill um, that would force teachers to refrain from assisting students in the subject of social transitioning. What are your thoughts on this bill and how it forces, uh, forces teachers to treat those students? I'm going to ask, could you repeat it one more time on the bill? Yes. I apologize. That's okay. No problem. A couple of weeks ago, our state representative 
filed a bill that would force teachers to refrain from assisting students in the subject of social transitioning. What are your thoughts on this bill and how it forces teachers to treat the students? Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> and I'm trying to keep track of whose turn it is. Oh, I support Jamie Bragg. He uh, he is a good representative. Um, as you may recall, representative four, uh, Mr. Bragg, um, is currently in federal prison. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is Jamie certainly is doing a tough job. He's attacking a difficult issue. He's doing it in a manner that he thinks is best. Um, it's hard to um, say one way or the other on this complicated issue other than I trust Representative Bragg. Uh, I believe that these type of decisions are for the parent and the family. It's between individuals that sometimes can't include the teacher or, or administrator. I know teachers want to help. I know teachers want to do what's best for the children. I know sometimes teachers think that they know better than the parent, and maybe they do, but we still have to draw a line sometimes. And, and on these type of issues, you know, I believe the parent is in a better position to make those decisions for the minor child than, this, than, than the well-intended teacher. As far as the bill, I probably need to better understand some of this, but generally speaking, I think when you're talking about some of these emotional pieces, obviously teachers are, are with students 35 to 48 hours a week, uh, all year round, and so in some cases they may have a better even a relationship with their, than their parents. But that doesn't mean that they take the place of the parent. Uh, I, I believe that some of these issues should obviously be handled outside the school system and with, the, with a parent, church, or whatever. Uh, but, you know, if when the, when the teacher takes on the role as the parent, that, that can cause some difficulties. Um, I would I would encourage teachers to focus on the academic piece um, and refrain from some of these social issues. The, uh, the, the challenge for teachers a lot of times is you care about your kids in, in, in every aspect, right? Like, uh, it's challenging to be a teacher, um, and so you have, you have this special place in your heart for the well-being of those kids. And the challenge there is um, how do you support a kid, and where is the line in which, hey, this is a major thing, and that needs to probably be a parent decision. Right? We're not talking about a child who wants to grow up and be Superman, or we, we want to grow up and um, be this or that. We're talking about a life-changing type of event that really needs to be decided by the parent and, um, and not by the educator. The educator's job is to be there uh, to educate. And when you get into something of this um, uh, magnitude, for lack of a better way to put it, uh, I think that's a parent thing and not a teacher thing. When um, I heard Representative Greg announce this on KY3, I think it was, it kind of surprised me because he said the teacher would have to file to be a sex offender. Um, I, I am not one to judge students and what they choose to do in their lives. That is not for me to judge as a Christian, that's God's choice. I am one that believes that a child needs to be feel safe in the school district, and if a teacher or a counselor wants to help that student and be there for them, I think they should. I do not think that they should cross the line as a teacher to encourage anything. I believe that goes back to the parenting and that student. But I do not believe that this is, I think you're stepping out of the local control of the school board. We want more and more to be able to run our schools on local control. When the government tries to step in at the state level and the federal level, trying to bring all these issues, it's like trying to take away from the local control. But I think you would have said a lot of teachers in that concern, and we are wanting to retain our good teachers. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we have some more time if anybody else has a question. Hi, my name is Tony Petrosino. Uh, we're talking about parent control or local control. We know four years ago with a pandemic, 
we maybe see it again this year. If we're talking about keeping the parents control or the control at the parent level, are you going to make sure that we do not bring masks back into school without and only leave it at the parent level and not the school level? <laughs> when uh, when COVID-19 hit, uh, we were in D.C. and my kids were, uh, I think it was May, March 13th, my son's birthday, we went out to eat, the next day they didn't, they didn't go back to school for a year and a half. <laughs> so they were at home, it was, it was like the worst time of their life, of course they were playing video games, they were supposed to be uh, online, Zoom and stuff like that. <laughs> so uh, they didn't go back to D.C., I'm not sure how it was here for, for about a year and a half. Uh, my youngest son didn't even go back because we homeschooled him because it was, it was ridiculous. So they had to, they, and he cried because he couldn't play with his friends uh, because of that mask ordinance. So did it, did it, say, did it help anyone? I'm not, oh, I don't want to get into the, to the medical pieces on it, but I think the biggest piece is the masks. Um, it, it created a, a sense of fear and uh, isolation from kids more so than preventing them and helping them in medical cases. So in my, in my piece, my case and my experiences, it, it, would, uh, it would hurt my kids for, for them to be masked, for them to have to wear masks or stay at home for that matter. So I would be against it. So another hot topic I hope we don't have to actually uh, handle, but um, you know, the, the difficulty about science is a lot of times you know after the fact, right? So you, you kind of have to live it to figure out what's going on. Uh, to be clear, I'm not a mask person, right? Uh, I've been around kids, uh, my, uh, I was kind of a science, I was a science teacher for high school and then my next job was in the elementary, which was, um, I wasn't sure that I would like and absolutely loved. Um, I couldn't explain that to you. But the one thing I know about kids is you can put a mask on whether or not the mask works or doesn't. They are going to sit there and touch the mask and then they touch everything else around them. So in some ways, you've just made it worse, right? We created a petri dish out of the entire classroom. Um, you know, the problem with the mask situation, Tony, is it's a no-win situation, right? Everybody has an opinion on it and no matter what you do, you're, you're losing. Right. And uh, am, I, am I a fan of the, and this happens a lot of school work, right? So am I a fan of the, the mask? Absolutely not. Um, is, it, is it a decision that the administration made at the time because they thought it was best for your school? I, I believe so. Do I want it? No. Right. I haven't heard that that is an issue that, it, that can happen again with masking. Uh, but I think we've learned a lot since 2020. I do believe at the time when that decision was made, we didn't know what this illness would do, COVID. People were dying right and left. We didn't know. All our concern was to keep our students safe. And I think that's the way we would look at it if we go into it again. But I don't think it's a topic that, that we're gonna have to worry about because I think things have changed since then. We've learned a lot. And I understand what parents want with their children. I, I understand that and I respect that. Uh, no mask. Um, I was an alderman uh, when the city uh, tried to institute a mask ordinance and I opposed it then. Um, I, uh, I do find it odd that, that now people who were forcing masks on us can look back and say, we didn't know. Well, half of us knew. And half of us stood up and said, no. And you know, we were right. For me, it was an issue of liberty. It wasn't about safety. You just can't tell an entire city that they have to wear something that may or may not work. It's, it's our decision what we do. It's our decision what we want our kids to do. I can understand if you're fearful and you want to stay home, but I can't understand if you're fearful and you want to make other people do what you do. So no, no defense. All right, and it is seven o'clock. So that was when we said we would end this chance tonight. Everybody? Um, I can't see their faces, so I don't know what happened tonight. Um, but on behalf of the Ozark uh, PTA District PTA group, we just want to thank you all for coming tonight and sharing with us and listening to our questions. 
and uh, being open and honest with us. It's it's just great to have four individuals that are willing to to do this. So um, best of luck to you. Um, Dr. Carson, do you want to give your announcement? He has a really great announcement. Yeah, so next Tuesday uh, in this room from uh, 5.30 to 7, we will be having a curriculum conversation, and it is about social media and how social media impacts families and then how that impacts school. So all of you are welcome to come, uh, and it will be, uh, I'm sure, a riveting evening. Uh, <laughs> there, there, we'll be watching a documentary. So the reason it's an hour and a half is we have there's a 53 minute documentary that uh, will uh, be what we use as our uh, feeder to really have the conversation. So all of your welcome. I was the, guys, I was the last one. I would highly encourage you to come. It was so well done. It bridges the gap between schools and parents so well. Highly encouraged. Would you say the time again? Because next Tuesday here in this room from 5 30 to 7. Okay, um, and if you have people that were supposed to come or wanted to attend this event tonight that couldn't make it, we did record the uh, everything tonight and it will be on the YouTube channel. Okay, the YouTube. <laughs> Um, but thank you again for coming, and we will have a meet and greet time now, so um, go with <laughs>